As the attorney general moves to unseal the warrant for the FBI search of Mar-a-Lago, we're learning a lot more about the lead up to that search. As Garland pointed out today, the department first pursued, quote, less intrusive avenues to recover those documents. NBC News has confirmed reporting that Trump received a federal grand jury subpoena this spring to turn over classified documents that they thought might still be at Mar-a-Lago, Do documents Trump's legal team discussed with DOJ officials on June 3rd. According to a source, that meeting was arranged with the Trump team's understanding that turning over relevant documents that day would fulfill the subpoena. It's not clear exactly what was turned over, but this week's search indicates that it wasn't everything the DOJ was asking for. In fact, the New York Times reports that two people briefed on the classified documents that investigators believe remained at Mar-a-Lago indicated that they were so sensitive in nature and related to national security that the Justice Department had to act. Back with me are Joe Weinbanks, Michael Steele, and Charles Coleman. Jill, I'll start with this. This is the part that kind of gets me in all of this. We've all been late, you know, on a, on a bill or a library book, and they send the first letter, and then they send that second letter that's kind of blue, so you can see it through the plastic, and, and then you get a phone call. W what on earth do you think that the Trump legal team could have been thinking? I mean, was there something else they could have done other than turning over the papers that they thought was going to avoid eventually getting searched? It's incredible to me to think that they were thinking. That's the first part of it, because it's so obvious that in this process, there was enough time for them to realize they were caught, that right. there was knowledge that they hadn't turned over everything, and they were given opportunities. A subpoena is not a search warrant. You still have time. Right. There was conversations. Someone went there in June and still they refuse to turn it over, which raises the question about what could be in those documents. Why did they, you know, it's one thing to say, well, I made a mistake, I didn't, you know, I was packing up in a right. fast way, I didn't mean to take them. But now you know you have them. Why would you keep on holding them? And, you know, I was general counsel of the Army. I had a clearance that was so high that I can't tell you the name of my classification level because that's classified. If these documents are in that category, it is a risk to national security. And remember, this was in an unlocked basement. They added a padlock after the FBI was there. So anyone, a guest in the hotel, could have gone in there. Someone playing golf there could have gone in there. The staff of the uh, place of Mar-a-Lago could have gone in there. So it was really at risk. And there are foreign visitors there. It could have been a foreign country. It's really a serious thing, and I think people need to take it much more seriously than they are taking it. Yeah, the, the danger that, and Jill, I think this is an excellent point, that anybody could have stumbled into it. Somebody could have been looking for other papers and potentially yes. found national security secrets uh, because the president refused to just return the documents to the government. Um, Charles, I want to start with you. I've got some sound here from, from Laura Trump talking about Garland's comments today. I want to get your thoughts on the other side. I'm kind of shocked to tell you the truth that it took three days for him to come out and really give us no information. I think a lot of Americans uh, were looking for something, anything that they could look to from the attorney general that would reassure them that this was not a political attack, uh, that they don't have to be worried, that they were overly aggressive, uh, you know, breaking into the home and raiding the home of a former president of the United States. I mean, that is a very big deal. Now, Charles, now that we have this additional information, right, we know that they didn't break into the former president's home. They didn't kick right. down the door, wave in a 4-4. It was nothing like that. He was given right. plenty of warnings beforehand. My question for you sort of legally is, when you hear these kinds of characterizations from Trump's surrogates, you know, is that something that could potentially land them in legal hot water? If you keep characterizing legal action as crimes that they were not, is that something the Department of Justice could look into? Could that be seen as obstruction of an investigation if people are constantly mischaracterizing what was a legally and basically uh, a highly previewed action on the part of the Department of Justice? Well, generally, Jason, the answer to that is going to be no, unless what we see from those essential lies, if you know that they're untrue, 
end up resulting in further action, a la January 6th. If you continue right. to push a conspiracy and you continue to push a lie, knowing that it's not true, and then there are actions and criminal actions that result as a result of that, then yes, now we're in a different category. Saying these things, peddling these lies by themselves, not likely very much to draw very much interest from the DOJ, but it depends on where they go. It's really important that people understand, don't get it confused. Regardless of whatever you may have thought, when Merrick Garland took the stage today, he let people know, I'm not a short order cook, I'm an executive chef, and you're gonna get this meal when this, when this meal is ready. And that's what he let people know. And he did it in the interest of the attorneys and the investigators at the FBI who have done such a good job of moving forward and doing things meticulously and strategically and methodically. And it's important for people to understand, Merrick Garland is a former federal judge. He has what you call judicial temperament. He knows how to do these things by the book. So you best believe that when he is executing these search warrants, when he is moving forward to sign a search warrant in terms of it being presented in front of a judge, he has crossed every T and dotted every I. So this really was about the protection of his own staff from this narrative that has become perverted and twisted by the right, from those who would seek to make this a political thing, because trust and believe that this man has already done everything that has been necessary in order to make sure that the execution of this search warrant, starting with the subpoena and then moving forward, has all been completely by the book. Michael, one of the things that we know about the Trump organization and Trump himself is that he's obviously freaked out and he's like, oh, there's, there's, there's somebody who must have ratted me out. There's somebody who must have given this information. I want to play this sound from Mick Mulvaney today talking about what the possibilities are and how the FBI could have known so specifically what was still at Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence. How close do you think that person in Trump's orbit would have had to be to know these details about where these documents were? Uh, really, that's a good question. Really close. I didn't even know there was a safe at uh, Mar-a-Lago, and I was the chief of staff for 15 months. So this would be someone who was handling uh, things on day-to-day, -day, who knew where documents were. So it would be somebody very close inside the president. My guess is there's probably six or eight people who had that kind of information. And here's the thing, Michael. I I'm sure that Donald Trump, who's already a paranoid guy, Look, if he could line up all of his friends and family and do a Nino Brown and walk around them with a baseball bat saying, which of you betrayed me, I'm sure he would. But the fact of the matter is you've got multiple people under investigation right now, many of whom have reason and incentive to possibly be the snitch. In this kind of situation, do you think this is indicative of maybe just one person revealing, hey, that's where the information is in Mar-a-Lago? Or do you think this might have been confirmed by multiple sources before the FBI took an action this drastic? Yeah, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of in the multiple sources uh, camp because of the narrowness of the the folks who are around Trump and and having spent some time with the man in the past, uh, having a sense of how he operationalizes things, um, it is a very it's very close quarters. So right. um, you know, people talk in those circles and people hear and they overhear, uh, and it's it's a matter of connecting those dots and relaying that information out and sort of painting the picture. So I, I think for, for, for a lot of different reasons, it's probably not just one person who's who made the call, um, because in, in one sense, that can be easily tracked and traced. Right. I think it's how you, uh, how that person very carefully might either place some information out on the street, uh, knowing that it would work its way to that person who would then place that information over there. Um, and that's, that's the thing about the Trump world. <laughs> They all thieves and hoodlums, and, and right. <laughs> they all rat each other out because they know at the end of the day the guy at the top doesn't give a rat's patootie about them. And that loyalty thing is one way. And so when you've got the feds coming after you, you've got investigations in two states, you've got a, a, a commission on government on, uh, on Capitol Hill coming at you. Yeah, everybody's going to have something yeah. to say at some point. There's a lot of people squealing uh, in Trump world right now. Jill Weinbanks, Michael Steele, and Charles Coleman, thank you all so much.